Good afternoon, everybody. Captain Bill Gussel with Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue Department. Lieutenant Dave Gates from our Driver Engineer Training Program. We are live today from Miami-Dade's Driver Operator Simulator Laboratory. If you just step away, we'll give the folks a little look there. And then uh, we're going to go for a, an e-ticket ride with Dave a little bit later. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Key Hose. You can reach them at keyfire.com. I have my hands, since I've gotten the training division, I have my hands on Key Hose every day that I'm at work. Uh, we are, are starting to uh, distribute three 75 foot sections of two inch hose with two and a half inch couplings for our standpipe operation. I'm not endorsing that for anybody else. It's just that after extensive testing, that's what works for us. We can achieve a flow of 250 gallons a minute at 45 pounds nozzle pressure on an inch and an eighth tip. And that requires an outlet pressure of 105 PSI for 225 feet. But one of the great things about key hose, specifically key combat ready, is their remarkable flow capabilities. Yes, our target flow is 250 gallons a minute, but what if we don't have the optimum pressure? In order for us to flow 250 gallons a minute and 225 uh, feet of the, or three 75 foot sections of key combat ready, two inch hose, it would require an outlet pressure of 105. But let's say we don't have 105. What if we only had 40? What if we only had 40? We would achieve a flow of 144 gallons a minute. If we had an outlet pressure of 50, we would achieve a flow through 225 feet of key combat ready two inch hose, 175 gallons a minute. 65 PSI, which is very common in pre 1993 buildings, you would achieve a flow of 200 gallons per minute. So it's an easy endorsement for me. Dave, could you tell a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the training program? Uh, hello, how are you guys doing? Uh, Lieutenant David Gates with Miami Dade Fire Rescue. I'm the driver training instructor. I've uh, been with the department 14 years. I've uh, been um, in the driver training program for about four years. Uh, a little bit about the the program um, the, the the biggest thing that we we do here is the certification process uh, train the guys we have guys that come they take their regular uh, basic pumping operations and hydraulics they get uh, they go through the state they get state certified and basically then they come to us uh, to get department certified um, in the past we've used another 40-hour class to get them department certified and get the ball rolling that way. Uh, recently, we transitioned over to a, a task book process, and the task book process kind of gets everybody involved. Uh, they're going to get skill sheets that they have to be signed off on, skills that they should be proficient with, but they're also going to be incorporating their drivers that are already out in the field and driving that might, might not have had the training necessary throughout their careers to keep up to date. So they're being you know, taught, they're learning the skills, while the new drivers are learning their skills, the officers then they become incorporated. Uh, our department was, it wasn't a requirement in the past for the driver uh, officer to be a driver. So now they're involved in the in the situation with the task book because they have to you know basically monitor the new driver, monitor their, their drivers, and ultimately the battalion chiefs are now involved as well because they they have to recognize that the training is going on, uh, units being out of service to train to get various skills done such as drafting relay pumping, tandem pumping, hooking up to an FTC. So basically everybody gets involved, and that's what one of the major uh, starting points here from the pumper perspective. And then from the pumper, you know, we, we have uh, the aerial program, we have new platforms, tankers, tenders, you know, multiple different facets of, of the organization. And what's, you know, usually not always incorporated is the actual, the driving portion. Now, the, the driving is actually just as important as the pumping aspect of it. Uh, we do have the simulator here that you guys see in the background, and that kind of helps a, a little bit with um, stuff that can't be handled out in the field. You know, we can drive the cone courses, but as far as the emergency reaction, that's where the simulator really comes into play, putting you in uh, positions or conditions where you can't do it in, in the real world. Uh, 
help with shuffle steering. That, that's a bit a major concern as well. And uh, that's pretty much it. No, it, it's. I don't know if it's this way in every state, but we are not required to have commercial driver's license, CDLs. And we're operating these heavy pieces of apparatus, and we're given a pass. So as you're going through and introducing yourself, as we go down the line, uh, guys, uh, I want to know a little bit about, is that is the case in your state as well? Maybe that's something on the federal level, I don't know. You all know who I am. I'm the oldest guy in the room. Uh, spent 30 years on engine two at station two, and recently I transferred to the training division because I'm the I'm old now. So I had to semi-retire. I'm in the training division, but I'm very proud to be here, and I've been tasked with uh, training our folks on uh, the use of the two-inch hose. So um, wait a minute. We got a question here. How many people in the training division do you have dedicated to training? Driver engineers. Um, currently, we have two dedicated strictly for the driver training program um, for the pumper aspect of it. Uh, we also do incorporate driver training for our rescues, which uh, also known as an ambulance. Uh, and there's there's two guys working in, in that division, and they're basically handling uh, accidents. So if there's an accident, guys will come back for retraining, uh, basic cone course uh, stuff like that. Uh, could you come up, Andrew? I'm going to introduce another member of the training staff, the driver engineering training staff, Andrew Silverman. Uh, I'm very proud of Andrew. I've known him since he was a little boy, and I worked with his dad. His dad retired as a um, battalion chief, and I would like to think that I'm instrumental in getting him to promise that he will never ride a motorcycle again. He hasn't. All right, very good, because he almost met his maker on a motorcycle in the fire service with all the murder and mayhem we see on motorcycles to ride motorcycles and be a firefighter so having i want to give you just a brief synopsis of one of my worst experiences uh with a pump operation i had a guy that i thought was competent and we had um, trained earlier in the day i had never driven for me before and we had a working fire and he froze. He just absolutely froze at the pump panel with a deer in the headlight stare and could not make a move. And I had a dear friend of mine who's also in the training division. He's now a lieutenant, Hector Cruz, come out with his SCBA on, come out of a fire building and go over and take over operations. And uh, one of the several times that he bailed me out. But that's my that's my experience. What what's what's yours, Dave? Uh, you know, one one of the recent stories that I heard about, and you know, familiarity with the truck is a big thing. Uh, we just got uh, purchased new Suffin platforms, and one of the things that happened, they were they were trying to charge a two and a half inch line, and when they're tried charging the two inch two and a half inch line, they needed a water supply. So the water supply was established to the truck, but the truck being a new truck and being unfamiliar. It had a master intake valve internal electronic. Uh, this truck particularly had a ball intake valve on it as well. So when the driver being unfamiliar with the truck, he opens up the ball intake valve and can't figure out why the truck doesn't have water. Can't figure out why he's not going to discharge another line. Um, basically, unfamiliarity with the truck, but also unfamiliarity with, well, how can we reroute this water? You know, there, there could be a possible obstruction here at the, uh, at the intake. Uh, we do use portable hydrants that also have two and a half inch uh, discharge outlets that we could have rerouted that water and use a three inch light into the auxiliary intake to at least establish water somehow in case something was going wrong. Would you tell them about the piece of rubber that you have that you put into the mat, the steamer intake of the pump that has the small hole in it? Uh, yeah, one, one of the other things that we do as far as the training, we have the guys come down and do one-on-one uh, -on -one training, uh, pump operations. Uh, we create a, a scenario for them where they're looking for a, a possible problem as far as an intake problem, a discharge problem, a pump problem, whatever the case might be. I tell them, you know, it might be, you might get all three problems. Uh, but we review all the skills, and when they uh, eventually have their water source and they're connected and they receive that incoming water, um, basically what I have is uh, either a piece of hose or a cone that goes right up against the intake and has a small hole. So they're receiving water. 
But as soon as they were to, say, fill themselves up with tank water, they immediately start to cavitate. Uh, if they were to try to open up another line, immediately their intake goes from 50 and bottoms out. Um, so their, their goal here is to recognize and realize that there's an issue, what the issue is. It's an obstruction at the intake. Uh, we've had a couple of scenarios on the department where uh, foam was up against the intake, actual foam balls, whatever might be in the hydrant, rocks coming up against the intake, obstructing that uh, flow source and basically choosing or finding an alternative route. Instead of just sitting there and panicking and, and freezing and, and taking minutes on end to come up with an alternative solution, we're going with, all right, we have other al alternatives, have the plan B. And that's what I call the, the plan B class. Uh, don't think about plan B. Have plan B when you come to the party and be ready to and go to it. Well, thanks. Sam Hiddle from Wichita, Kansas. A little bit about yourself and your most memorable pump operation experience. Um, Captain with uh, Wichita Fire Department and a uh, traditions training and structure. Um, just in case I do forget, uh, we do require a class B CDL license for our uh, operators to drive apparatus. And when we were um, assisting with driving the ambulance system, which is separate, we had to also go through their driving program at that time. Um, I would say the most memorable one for me was the first time that I realized that driving wasn't something that was just fun, that um, there was a lot of responsibility. You're uh, on your own and the entire fire ground could be counting on you was when uh, the intake cap had frozen and I ended up having to pull a hundred foot section of five inch off of the static bed so I could get around to a different discharge cap to get the uh, two story operation in service. Thank you, Sam. And our next participant, Paul Shapiro, if I have been a student of Paul Shapiro's since the mid eighties and uh, he's probably arguably written more pump and water supply articles in, in more publications than anybody I know. And I think that uh, I, 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 along with so many other people that are into water supply and pump operation, are students of Paul Shapiro and have been most of their career. So now that I've given you a big head there, Paul, can you tell a little bit about yourself and your most memorable pump experience? Okay, uh, now that you've given me that big head, I'll let you know how that big head was smacked by a two and a half here in just a second. <laughs> um, I'm a retired engineer from Las Vegas Fire Department. That's basically for you people that don't live here is downtown area and then it extends out north. Clark County Fire Department comes all the way up to Sahara for the main route, um, but everybody calls it Las Vegas Fire Department. I spent 28 years there. Uh, I also got involved with pump evolution training uh, really on in my career. And to this day, I'm still learning and still teaching large flow water delivery operations. Uh, got my book coming out sometime in the near future. They've already started editing on it. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, my most memorable experience for everybody but me is uh, my second shift promoted as an engineer. We had a high-rise fire downtown. My engine was fourth in, which even though I'm an engineer, they would have taken me up because I was a younger engineer then. Uh, but my captain told me to stay down and watch the pump operations. Um, we just had one engine pump in the building. So I helped them connect, connect all the two and a halfs, which was every discharge port on the truck and I'm standing in front of the panel with two guys. I'm in the middle. There's a guy on each side of me. And the last thing I remember is water splashing me in the face. The next thing I remember is being walked to the ambulance. My eyes swelled shut and all I could think of, and I, and I realized it was repetitive questioning, but all I could say is, am I in trouble? Am I in trouble? Am I in trouble? Uh, two and a half pulled out of the coupling and whacked me right in the head. Uh, it, what's funny about it is because I deal with large diameter hose a lot, to this day, most people in my department think it was a five inch. I said, no, that would have killed me. You know, Paul, I got to give the Chicago Fire 
fire department credit, man. They hook up a line to uh, a pump. They've got a rope right there. They snag that thing, and they usually, it's either permanently connected or they put around the steamer cap. And, uh, but uh, this is something we just experienced recently here. We had a failure of an adapter uh, in the polymer uh, bearings within it. Uh, and it, it had failed catastrophically. And in fact, um, I'm going to ask everybody that's watching, if you've had an experience with a coupling, a large diameter coupling with a swivel that has some kind of bearings in it, failing, uh, would you please, I guess, Bill Carey, what would be the best way for them to contact us if uh, he'll probably come up with a hashtag? And we'll figure out by the end of this uh, hangout the best way that you could contact us because uh, we don't want this to happen again. So having said that, let's go on to Ed Collette. If I could just say a little bit about Ed. Ed and I are, uh, became friends uh, just this last year. And he, we were then uh, networking on pump operations, engine company operations. Uh, he's, Ed has written some outstanding articles. He's a rising star in the field of uh, pump and water supply evolutions. He's kind of a younger version of Paul Shapiro. But Ed, if you could tell a little bit about yourself and your most memorable pumping experience. Thanks, Cap. Well, I got to work on the mustache to catch up with Paul there first off. So that's got to be a ways out. Um, well, you got to work with your chief. <laughs> Let you do it. Um, Ed Culler, I'm from Jackson Township in Stark County, Ohio. I've um, been running pumps for about 16 years now. In Ohio, we do not have to have a Class B license to operate the engines. And, you know, my most memorable experience was early on, I actually had, it was a car fire. There was an air pocket in the pump that wouldn't let the water flow from the tank to the pump. So, after a little bit of troubleshooting, priming it, we finally got water going to the fire. But that kind of started my habit that you know, every time I go off tank water, I pull the primer. Just it's a habit I got into, you know, and it ensures, you know, that I'm going to have a prime from the tank. And interestingly, we had the same thing with our tower that Dave just described as far as the double intakes on it. And it took Actually, I think the captain had to come down from the bucket to get water into the truck for him. Let's go back to truck familiarization. You know, we're very quick to talk about our, our accomplishments, but uh, not as quick to talk about our mistakes when, in fact, if fellow firefighter, brother, sister firefighter makes a mistake and they, they, they are outgoing with it, forthcoming with that information, that's one less mistake that maybe you or I would make. How about that handsome man there from uh, the West Coast? Uh, Mr. Liggins, could you tell a little bit about yourself and your uh, your most memorable pumping experience? I thought you were talking about me, Bill. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he said handsome. He said handsome. So we know he's not talking about you. <laughs> Oh, so, um, well, I'll start off with um, my most embarrassing one, and that was only just last year, and uh, fortunately, we were just teaching a class, but we actually had a, a live car burning in uh, just in a suburb of uh, Illinois, and it just happened to be with familiarity with, with the rig. Um, I was driving the rig. We pull up to this this car, I know how to operate a pump. I had been a pump operator for you know many years, and uh, put the rig in pump. Try to charge the line. I can't get any water, but I get another instructor. The tank to pump was closed, so I work in a warm weather climate. We always keep water in the pump, and our tank to pump in the in position is open. Where I guess in a lot of the country you have to pull that. Uh, handle out to get water from the tank to the pump. I wasn't familiar with that. You know, fortunately it was a class and we were recovering, but there were students there. So probably my most embarrassing, but uh, we have to be familiar with whatever rigs we're driving. But Carol, I do have to back that up with a success story. Go ahead, Bill. 
well, just uh, you're with you're with Oakland, but I understand that you are now a captain. It, yes. When you, were, when you were promoted. Did they move you out of your your company? Uh, yeah, they always move you out of your your company if you promote to any rank. Yeah. So, um, and then before I tell my next story, I don't want to forget. Uh, there was a question asked about what we require as a engineer. To drive any apparatus, uh, a lot of departments are, the department can require a class B. We had uh, needed a B, but now it's just a C with a firefighter endorsement. So from the uh, uh, California Department of Motor Vehicles, you have to get a firefighter endorsement. That requires driving the rig and a road test and all. Um, and then also, uh, I would say my most successful story, because I do want to balance this out. I want to just paint a picture as an idiot. <laughs> uh, I was driving a rig and this is a, a good lesson for any members out there driving older apparatus where the pump shifts are electric pump shifts. I know most of them now are pneumatic and the pneumatic pump shifts are very reliable. Uh, so this is about 20 years ago. I was driving a uh, engine with an electric pump shift and most modern engines have a management system where the rig will automatically start shutting down non uh, unnecessary devices to, to allow uh, more important uh, features to take place. Uh, someone had taught me if I couldn't get the rig and pump to shut down the light, shut down the headlight, shut down everything not necessary. And luckily I, I remembered that, but as we were going to the fire, we were first due. And I remember every time I hit that mechanical growler, the lights in the cab would dim and the headlights would dim down. I didn't know why, but that was happening all the way there. What I didn't know is the alternator was out and the rig was only charged because of it charging in the station. When we arrived, I flipped the pump switch. I'm trying to get it into drive. It is not shifting into pump. I shut down the headlights, shut down the emergency lights and the rig went into pump. Luckily it was a, it was a bedroom fire. We got that out, but that same rig, weeks earlier had been used at a fire and it was unable to go into pump and unfortunately people were chopping that up uh, as an engineer mistake and not in a problem with the apparatus. So if you are driving some uh, older piece of equipment or an engine with the electric pump shift, remember that's something that you may, may be faced with. Daryl, do your rigs have a, uh, an emergency pump shift? Uh, we do, it, you know, in a manual emergency pump. I've never seen it have to be used uh, or, or, you know, uh, even really heard of any stories of anybody using it. I, have, I haven't had much experience with that. We, that's something you teach though, Dave, and you're... Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the uh, requirements for the department uh, as far as checking out the truck. It's a weekly mandated thing that we manually put the truck in the pump so that so the guys would know how to do it in case there was a failure, something that we review. Yep, and that, that would have been really important in a situation like this. And then also someone else had a question about uh, staffing, full-time staffing in, in case they're trying to figure out their staffing for their training division. We're a much smaller department than Miami-Dade. We're only about 500 members and we have one full-time a uh, person at the training division dedicated to maintaining licenses, uh, driver training, and and all things to do with the engineers. Okay, very good. Clark Lamping, sir, how was your trip to Mexico? Mexico is fantastic, just fantastic. Thank you for asking. And before I get started, I've got to throw a prop out to Polly Shapiro. This is the, the latest edition of Fire Rescue Magazine. And if you flip the, I guess it's the last print edition of Fire Rescue Magazine. If you flip to page 37, well, look whose ugly mug is on page 37 of Fire Rescue Magazine right there. <laughs> so Polly continues to write um, relevant stuff, relevant stuff. So, um, yes, uh, my name's Clark Lamping. I'm a captain with the uh, Clark County Fire Department here in the Las Vegas area. I'm a neighbor of Polly's. I'm working at Station 11 on Las Vegas Boulevard. <clears throat> Um, uh, as far as the first question, we have similar to what uh, Daryl said in Oakland, we have an F endorsement, a fire endorsement on our licenses. It allows us to drive apparatus and all that certification process is done in-house 
and then our our department sends that information to the DMV and they off they just put the stamp on the license. So that's how we that's how we certify our drivers. Um, most embarrassing uh, story: I was an engineer for about five years. Spent most of my time at Station 14, uh, Engine and Rescue House. And uh, one day we had a transmission problem. I believe it was a transmission problem on engine 14. So a mechanic shop called up, said, bring engine 14 in. They put us in a reserve for a few days. I wanted to fix the transmission. Um, they called us back a couple shifts later, said, transmission's fixed, come get the engine. So we went and picked up the engine again, and I did my usual walk around. I, I did not, I did not pump it because they did not fix the pump. They didn't work on the pump. So I didn't think I had to check the pump when it got out of the mechanic shop. So unbeknownst to me, um, when the mechanics take an apparatus before they put it on the lift, they empty the water tank um, because of all that water weight. That's 40,000 pounds of water. We have 500 gallon tanks. So they emptied the whole water tank to put it on the lift. They repaired the transmission. They dropped it down, called us up. We picked up the engine. When I did my walk around, I looked at the sight glass. I didn't see a bubble in the sight glass. I incorrectly assumed that, that tank was full it was bone dry bone dry put the rig back in service drove it for the rest of the shift no problem next shift comes on c platoon they come on um i get a call at about noon that next day on my day off and they tell me they had a fire and the the water tank was bone dry and it caused a delay of getting water to the firemen um so that uh in that apparatus so uh an extremely extremely valuable lesson to me um, I got a chewing like you've never heard before because the uh, the sea platoon captain was not as nice as, as my captain, and I was ringed by someone else's captain. Uh, it was it was a pretty traumatic event for me, upsetting to me. And to this day, I tell that story to every single engineer that works for me. I tell that story. And when we get a rig back in service from the mechanic, no matter what happens, I insist that they actually manually inspect that water level on that vehicle. So. Thank you, Clark. A uh, couple things, some just some housekeeping. Um, you can go to fire and amateur hose coupling or adapter failing. Please, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, maybe I could learn from your experience, somebody out there. The other thing is I'm, I'm greatly relieved. Um, I was not aware that uh, Fire Rescue Magazine will remain in uh, online. Uh, and that would have been a damn shame if it, it was not. Um, I, I love Fire Rescue Magazine. I mean, I write for fire engineering, but there's a place in the fire service for Fire Rescue Magazine. It has some outstanding authors. It has kind of a column format, which I'm going to guess, Chief Halton, we're going to continue. It's just going to be online. And uh, uh, that's news to me, but that's good news to me. Could you tell a little bit about yourself there, Chief Halton? A little bit. And uh, we are keeping it alive online. Yeah, good, good, good. Could you tell a little bit about yourself and maybe a pumping mishap? Yeah, I'm, I'm the second oldest person. Bill is three weeks older than me on this call. So, <laughs> and he's far fitter. So a couple, a couple of things popped to mind when, when Bill was talking. Hose construction matters, right? How your hose is made is really important. So when you're talking about a key hose, obviously made with the highest quality standards, uh, look into the construction of the hose you're buying. It's very important. Also, the liners, various liners can have different friction losses. So be careful about things like charts and numbers. Always flow test your hose, flow test your hose, and flow test your hose again. Uh, pressure testing is excellent if you're going to be using your hose as an airbag, but probably much more effective to flow test it to see what your friction loss is on your various uh, lines. CDLs uh, was required in Albuquerque, uh, not so here in, in my volunteer fire department in Oklahoma. Um, training, I love the pump simulator. The one thing, uh, outlet pressure is always important. We're talking about outlet pressure. Again, uh, don't rely on calculations in your standpipe kit. Make sure you have a gauge. Every time you hook up to a, a standpipe or a, a, another source, make sure there's a gauge there so that you actually know what that outlet pressure is where you are, because that's where it matters, right? Not, not it, not in some Rube Goldberg game or some standpipe that might be occluded. So, um, so here's an interesting story. That my my biggest pumping deal I ever had. Uh, we went out to a Church of the Latter Day Saints, it was a historic building, a beautiful complex, and uh, we had a fire at about uh, 
uh, at two, two o'clock in the morning or so, three o'clock in the morning, and uh, a really brilliant young officer named uh, Chris Chavez came out and uh, light smoke showing. And he said, we can't do this. Came over to the uh, battalion buggy I was in. I'd, I'd been uh, on the buggy for, I don't know, a couple of months maybe. And uh, I said, boy, you got to give me more, man, because there's only light smoke showing. He said, Bobby, uh, I got heat below me. I got heat above me. There's a spiral staircase in there. There's just something wrong with this fire. So I said, okay. I trusted Chris. We pulled out. We got ready to do uh, exterior operations after we decided to burn the roof off the building. It's old, old, probably 100-plus-year-old building, real Spanish tile, real tiles, not, not the modern tiles. I mean, these are the real old Spanish tiles. Roof comes in. Uh, we tell the guys that the, the, the master streams fired up, right? And uh, everybody had lines connected to all the, the, the aerial devices. A little bit of water comes spurting out and then nothing. And the supply lines are hard as rocks. The five inch hard as rocks. All the, all the lines still hard as rocks. Everybody's scratching their heads. Well, we didn't flush the hydrants. We didn't flush the hydrants. And uh, it cost us a great amount of time. We had a call in at the time. We had a second alarm already there. We had a call in a third alarm with buckets and mops to go up on the roofs of buildings where embers the size of footballs were landing on fire. Uh, so it was quite the night. Um, my deputy chief arrived and, and brought in a command vehicle. Later on, uh, the chief arrived. And when the chief arrived, he said, boy, it looks like sunrise at 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, uh, he looked out the window of the front of the vehicle, and he says, that's got to be the biggest fire I've ever seen. And the deputy said, oh, that's nothing, chief. Look out this window. And he looks out, and he goes, well, there's the second biggest fire I've ever seen because the, the, it, was, it was so large. It was uh, – it was massive. We, we, we uh, burnt it to the ground with panache. And, and, and uh, kudos to Chris Chavez, who uh, I don't know where Chris is these days. I'm, I'm sure he's retired long since like myself, but um, incredibly insightful uh, uh, officer, a very talented officer, and he read that fire perfectly. It was an arson fire that the guy had lit fires below him and above him, um, and Chris read it like, like a textbook because he had skin in the game, he had experience. He, he was a, he always paid attention, and and he put he always put his people first. So uh, learned a, learned a lot of great lessons that night. Um, trust your people, flush your hydrants, and uh, pay attention. You know, I, I learned something, uh, Chief, uh, from a, a guy that uh, worked in shop at the water and sewer department. I never could figure out how we got all the gravel in the hydrant. What he explained to me, Chief, is that when they have a break in a water main, the water rushing through the main creates a venturi, and of course you bed your, 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 with a river rock or a coral, we use coral rock here, and it sucks it up in there, and man, it ends up, and like what Dave, and that's one of the things that Dave does with that piece of rubber, is that the guys are starting it off with a static pressure and then a residual pressure. Well, that residual pressure keeps going down and down and down, correct? Right. Because in, in our case, it's rocks. And, it's and, rocks. And, and what we had was what is classified as type C soil, which is also important that you know the type of soil in your, in your region, because if you're gonna be doing, say, a trench rescue and things like that, understanding your soil types is very important. We had type C soil, which is very uh, sandy, lots of small rock and gravel, and exactly what had happened, they'd had a water main break, they had gone in a couple of uh, weeks earlier, maybe months earlier, they'd repaired the break, but a, a vast amount of sediment apparently had remained in that line, and, and it literally went through uh, all the pumps, it screwed with the impellers, and it actually got to the nozzles on the aerial devices, uh, which at the time were fog nozzles, causing a catastrophic failure uh, of three or four aerial devices, uh, and took two pumps out of commission. It's uh, We're past our halfway point. Um, I want to reiterate what the good Chief Halton said about flow testing. Uh, Dave came to me uh, one day at my desk and said, hey, I need some hard numbers, brother. Well, I was calculating our, uh, our, our pressure, standpipe outlet pressures, just based on outlet pressure and gallons per minute. And, you know, we would, uh, we had an inline we have a combination inline flow meter and pressure gauge. It's some, something similar to the, what FDNY uses. And it's accurate up to about 250 gallons a month. 
because it has a very short barrel. Uh, you need the long barrel on a flow meter for um, uh, turbulence, and that's something I just learned recently, why that barrel is so long. It's turbulent. Uh, but uh, flow testing is absolutely uh, essential. Again, when you're looking at those sheer numbers, did they come from Shepherd's Hydraulics, you know, from uh, 50, 60, 100 years ago? Uh, the dynamics has changed. Uh, we had uh, a, a, a premium grade hose uh, that back in the 90s had a friction loss of 40 PSI per 100 feet at 185 gallons a minute. That same hose today, it's about 25. So things change, cross-sectional area, smoothness of the lining. There's no substitute for flow testing. Uh, the other thing is, just because a uh, you looking at a popular, well-known, respected brand of fire hose, there's various grades. Now, I will say that every grade of key is good. There are some that may be a, a certain brand and are made in China and has astronomically high friction loss. So get out and flow test your hose. Don't go cheap on hose. Lieutenant Gates, sir. Sir. Could we go for a little ride here in the simulator? Now, guys, uh, <laughs> we're, I learned this from you, Bob. Makes or things going wrong. So we're just going to see if we can get it here. Can you see it okay, fellas? Can't tell. Looks good, Billy. Right there? Okay, I'm going to hold it right there, Chief. Gates, did you hit anything? Not yet, not yet. Anticipation. Emergency reaction is basically what this means. Gates, if you get car sick on us in front of all these people, it's going to be so embarrassing for our department. <laughs> Go ahead, Gates. Go ahead. Go ahead. I need, I need to concentrate on the room. Sir. All right. Okay. All right. Hurry up. It's a big fire. Basically, we need, we need to maintain the same speed. Okay. Uh, okay. That's the idea behind us. All right. We have Dade County uh, traffic here. I see. Yes. So is, is every car in Florida red? Uh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Dave, you almost hit the kid uh, on the I bike. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Uh, coming through here. Oh. <laughs> The idea here is we're going to maintain the same speed no matter what happens throughout the entire scenario. So no brakes. Are we there yet? Dave, you're driving the same way you drove me home from the Union Hall after that party the other night. Couldn't distinguish between. Oh, now we have another uh, scenario here. Oh, oh, we can't, we can't break. So, oh, it does. It, it plays with your head. Okay, all that for a medical call, Gates. For God's sake. <laughs> I learned that from you, Bobby Halt, and don't be afraid to take a chance with our Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just continue, I'm very proud of these videos. Uh, we're going to hope that the sound is going to work, but Dave has produced what I think is world-class videos. And Sarah, if you can uh, play the first one, and hopefully the volume will work. First one is on drafting. drafting. Okay. Primer, primer the strap. Right, without a primer. So, Sarah, if you could, you could bring that up for us. Get the sound. Hey, Dave, just you're just going to have to talk over it. Okay. All right, well, this this is just an introduction. I'm introducing myself there. Uh, basically, what we're going to be uh, covering is drafting in case you have a non-functioning primer. Uh, which tends to ha happen. Uh, we have new trucks that have air primers, but our, our older fleet has, uh, you know, 
the regular primer uh, with the motor that will fail. And uh, every year doing pump testing, those primers fail. Uh, what we're doing here is setting up, basically making sure that our uh, taking care of the problems that would exist before we came into the troubleshooting methods, making sure that our drains are closed, making sure that we have gaskets, making sure that we are mallet tight. Uh, this particular scenario here, uh, we're using a full tank of water. We're using an adapter here. We've got a ball intake valve. If you had a master intake valve, it would be the same thing. Basically, under normal drafting conditions, that, that intake valve, that would be open. Water would escape. Right now, what we're doing is closing that ball intake valve where you can close your master intake valve, reestablishing a prime. So now we have established a prime with their uh, tank to pump. Tank fills up, evacuating the air. This is going fast. Um, but basically what we did there, we uh, opened up a, a discharge. Now we're starting to flow water. As soon as we have water supply established, um, now we're introducing air into the system. We open that intake valve up. Now we're creating a, a negative pressure. Uh, water is going to rise. And I started off by saying uh, with a non-functioning primer, you can still pull a draft within 45 seconds. Basically, the negative pressure that is created from the impeller spinning and in spinning that air is what's going to create that that water to rise uh, because of the atmospheric pressure and the vacuum that is created. Uh, this second method here, we're talking about uh, not having an intake valve, not being able to establish your own prime and flow of water initially. Uh, what we're doing is opening up a discharge, choose the front discharge. I'm throttling up here to 1800 to 2000 RPMs. Uh, I'm opening up my tank to pump at this point in time. Uh, this is when I start talking about the uh, EMS reference of look, listen and feel. We're looking, listening and feeling. Uh, this will take, uh, again, less than 45 seconds, uh, losing less than a quarter of a gallon, a uh, uh, quarter of a gallon, a quarter of a tank of water between 100, 250 uh, GPMs there. Uh, we're initially going to open up that discharge. We're going to get uh, usually a, a false prime. That's so we open that tank to pump. We're flowing water. We're flowing air. And once we catch it, initially, uh, we'll get a we'll get a prime because the pump is primed and full of water, but our drafting hose is not. Drafting hose takes a little bit of time. Once it fills, uh, we initially immediately need to start gating down because the pressure, uh, basically this churn test that we have now created by putting our RPMs up so high, the pressure that is now created when it comes in is upwards to 300 PSI if we do nothing at all. Uh, so we immediately need to start gating back down on that valve that we have open and start throttling down. I used 100 PSI as the, the goals to start gating down to. So because we use the water to get the water, we're going to then refill ourselves. Uh, we're closing down our tank to pump, refill our tank. Uh, we can refill our tank. And again, we wouldn't want more than 100 PSI entering into our tank, uh, which, which, which could rupture the tank. The fittings could become loose and we could have problems that way. Uh, some people would, would say that we can go ahead and use, instead of using the discharge being a discharge that's flowing water, a discharge such as the, the tank fill. And that the same effect could be created by using the tank to fill, not using the water. We're circulating some, but uh, the problem there is with using the tank fill during that operation is that initial surge of pressure that comes in once you achieve that draft, and it's 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 a lot. And if you're not careful and you're not immediately gating down and immediately throttling down, you risk rupturing your tank in that in that fashion. So I just use a, a discharge that we're going to flow right back into the source. So it's not really going to affect anybody, and we achieve the draft that way as well. Sarah, let's run that next video. If you've never seen a jet siphon. It's, this is really neat. And uh, by the way, a lot of people don't know, Dave, that you are a radio announcer for hockey games oh, because you narrated that really good. That and good. I think you can tell that Dave knows his stuff. He has his head and his heart in the game. Sarah, run the next video. Okay, there's that handsome guy again. Uh, Again, brief introduction here. Basically, we're going to be using a uh, jet siphon, water Sorry. water jet eductor. So the water jet eductor here is some uh, drone footage. Uh, basically, what we're doing, this particular setup here, we actually use two, but we're going to start off with one. This is one of the videos that uh, I created for our pump operator class. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're discharging water at 175 PSI. Uh, we're returning water. The, the water that's being pushed back is coming back at about... Uh, 200 gallons a minute, and this water is being recirculated and we're using that water continuously. Uh, the water jet adapter here does have an advantage as far as you can be up to 200 feet away and still be able to uh, use that, that static source. Um, 
um, which is an advantage. Uh, basically, they're looking uh, any obstructions, making sure that the connections are spanner tight because we are going to be discharging at 175 PSI right off the bat. Uh, the more hose that you're using, the higher pressure. Basically, by five, if I was using 100 feet of uh, five inch and three inch, then I'd start at 180 PSI. Uh, we're using an uh, empty foam bucket there for a flotation device. This uh, particular unit is about 48 pounds. It will sink down to the bottom. And if it does happen to you know, turn over, you know, the screen could possibly be obstructed. So we do use a foam bucket. We also use a, a, a rope as well, optionally, uh, in case that we do charge it. When we do charge it, if it kinks off to the side, we are able to use that rope to bring it back. Uh, basically what we require here, just regular pump operations. We're opening up our tank to pump. We're throttling up first. So when we throttle up, we're giving it that 175 PSI directly to the adductor, which it requires. Immediate flow back, back to our uh, ball intake valve there. Uh, within seconds, it comes back. Water is going to be at that bleeder. We're closing that bleeder, opening up. Now we have established our water supply. Uh, immediately close the tank to pump because we're now working with a uh, limited supply, meaning that we can only flow 670. If we start achieving or flowing more than that 670, our tank to pump being open is going to support that system until we run dry. So tank to pump needs to be closed immediately. Tank filled to we use the water to achieve water. We're refilling ourselves, and then we're going to open up and uh, whatever discharge it is. But we always have to maintain 175 psi on that uh, three-inch line that we're supplying. Uh, master stream on the deck gun, 100 psi. Uh, this particular case, we're uh, we're going over the collapsing of the line. Basically, if I'm flowing too much. My line will then collapse. My line collapses. I'm going to immediately go into my tank to pump, my backup resource, open it up. My line uh, restores itself. And whatever operation I, uh, that caused that collapse, I'm just going to immediately start getting that line down. Once it recovers, close my tank to pump, refill. Um, this is uh, the, the tandem operation. We already established the one operation of flow, flow in 670. We set up a second unit on the officer side, uh, established that supply and we're basically doubling our water flow. So we got two uh, water jet eductors in the water, but capabilities of now flowing upwards towards 1,400 gallons a minute in that situation. So the water jet eductor, it has the, uh, that option. Um, swimming I mean, pools, right? Swimming I mean, pools. Swimming pools is an option for us. You have a, you know, a place where we don't have a water supply, no, no hydrant system, and there's no uh, lakes or anything around that static water source is the, is the backyard. We got uh, a swimming pool. Uh, we can also use this thing for uh, dewatering uh, basements, such as, you know, we don't have basements here in Florida that many. There are some territories that do, but uh, that would be an option for that particular unit. Dewatering uh, a boat on a boat fire, something like that, that could be an option. So it is a useful piece of equipment. It is quick, it is easy, and it's fast to establish that water supply. Uh, but you can run into trouble if you're not uh, used to operating it. And the biggest thing there is the, that I find is the tank to pump, tank to pump being left open. And supporting the actual system and running the tank dry. And once the tank runs dry, that's it. It's ball game over. Um, we have a water supply. Hey Dave, uh, we thought we were going to have sound, but we didn't. But you did it. <laughs> I just I, I tried my best. You did. You did. You did fine. It's it going to be. Forward, but. Yeah, it's going to be on Fire Engineering's webpage. Uh, I'm very proud of you and proud of the department uh, for making that video. And I'm looking forward to other ones as well. But um, I think you can tell that Dave has his head and his heart in the job. See how we're doing here on time. Does anybody have, have any of, questions or comments about Dave's videos? I do. I have a, a couple of questions. Go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, when would those videos be available on fireengineering.com? That's going to be our Bill Carey again. I know that he is the, uh, he's like the Wizard of Oz. He's behind the curtain. And he'll probably flash that up on the screen here before we finish. And then the other thing is, um, I mean, first of all, for a city like I work in, um, I'm working in a city where we had a fire boat, but now we're probably one of the only major cities with a, a large port without a fire boat. And that was a, a good plan for backup water supply. But um, also we teach our, engineers how to draft there's been talk of like taking that out of the program but i think that would be a mistake i think 
all engineers should be capable of drafting for no other reason than just having a good understanding of how the pump works. Um, but this device specifically, this turbo draft seems like it would be a great addition to even a city like ours because most of our opportunities to draft, we can't get close to the water. We have the estuary, we have Lake Merritt, we have the bay, um, swimming pools and other lakes throughout the city. But in most of those cases, and I'm sure a lot of other cities, you cannot get close to the water source. So um, it seems like a great addition, but I guess as far as questions, my one question is, you said 670 GPM was the limit. It, it, did I hear that right? And if so, why? Yeah, with the, uh, the available water that you have coming back at you, it's uh, basically you're using 200 gallons, pushing and recirculating. So you're closing in on about 900 gallons coming back and pushing back at you. 200 is being recirculated and used to generate the 670 limit that you have. Um, and this is based off of length as well. So the further away you are, the actual less available water that you have for yourself. So mm -hmm. as far as 200 feet away, you were only uh, capable of about 440 GPMs to be able to produce in that fashion. Okay. Well, the good news is, according to Bill Carey, is that um, uh, the videos will be available in 15 minutes on Fire Engineering's website. So uh, that's great. Any other questions? Any other comments for Dave? Yeah, Dave. Do you carry one of those eductor systems on every one of your engines then? No, we, uh, we have about six that are on our apparatus down south. We have, a, well, there's three down south for us, and uh, basically they have a rural area where hydrants are limited. So they deal with drafting down there. They're throwing wells in the agricultural well pipes, stuff like that. But we have three units down south that carry them. We have three... Um, more that carry them towards areas where they have canals where hydrants are not accessible they deal with a lot of brush fires in, in that area uh, we do have a couple more um, that are not necessarily carried on units but are available within the battalion in areas where hydrants are limited that they would know that within a certain territory that they have a canal off of that uh, territory but not a hydrant within the system so in a total, I would say out in operations, there would be eight available for the units, uh, but no, they're not carried on all. And this is, we have a very diverse uh, jurisdiction. Uh, you could start out in the morning working in down, way down south uh, amongst uh, potato fields, tomato fields, avocado groves. Rural, extremely rural, uh, no hydrants whatsoever. And then end up your shift in a place like Adventura, Sunny Isles, right on the uh, the Atlantic Ocean, with uh, multi-story high rises, very dense population. So, it's a, it's a it's a very diverse uh, area of responsibility that we have in in, in uh, Miami Dade County. Any other questions, comments for Dave? Um, I've got one quick question. You guys used five inch for your return line. Is is that size? Mandatory, or what if you use three inch? Uh, the, the initial, there's different models for the units, but that's, uh, that one has a storage coupling. So if you had a four inch here, you could use that. Uh, that would just limit the, the supply down. They do have a unit that has a, uh, a two and a half and an inch and a half. So you would uh, discharge with your a two and a half and an uh, inch and a half or inch and three quarter, and the return line would be a two and a half inch, or three inch, so depending on the size of the unit itself. Okay. So, our particular unit is uh, that we use there was a uh, two and a half by storage connection fitting. So we use three inch line and a five inch uh, supply. Paul, I've got a question for you. Uh, is an emergency pump ship, the manual pump ship, is that a requirement of the NFPA 1901? I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. It, it should be if it's not, but I'm pretty sure it is. It isn't. It is not? No, because there's two, our neighboring engines, there's two of them without it. And we went through specking an engine. And I asked that same question of the manufacturer because it wasn't a standard on the list. And they said a lot of people actually go away from them because they corrode off and break off. And there again, it goes to back not checking things again, right. but it is not in the standard. Wow. That's yeah. good to me. <laughs> 
for, for our viewers, uh, this was posted a, a few years ago. Uh, the City of Miami Fire Department produced some excellent pump operation videos uh, produced at the time by Captain uh, John Crawford. And he goes into great detail on how to uh, put a pump in gear when you can't get it in gear. I mean, including such things as correcting a butt tooth condition by shutting off the apparatus, getting underneath the rig and turning the drive shaft while a, uh, a partner pushes in on the uh, emergency pump ship. It goes into great detail. Uh, you can see it on YouTube, uh, City of Miami Pump Operation or something like that. And uh, it, it's well worth watching. He did a fine job on that. Anybody else for Dave? Okay, let's see how we're doing here on time. Oh, hey, we're just about ready to wrap this up. And uh, what do we got here? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We got some research here. Dave, you want to tell us about this? Well, this is uh, basically the, the models as far as the two and a half by one and a half inch model for the, the water jet eductor. The capabilities there with the 50 foot line is only 264 gallons a minute. So that was uh, another uh, addition as far as this size capabilities. So that particular model only capable of 264. The larger model, which has the storage five inch uh, coupling is capable of generating about 170 gallons a minute of usable water. And again, using the uh, the tandem operations, which is uh, basically doubling your, your flow. I was able to gener generate uh, close to 1,400 gallons a minute using two of those uh, devices. Clark, any uh, last thoughts? Oh, yeah, another shout out to Key. Well, I'm getting ready to go put my mitts on Key as soon as I walk out of this room at 2 o'clock because I've got Battalion 12 here where they're training on the two-inch hose. And again, our target flow is 250. <clears throat> That's at an outlet pressure of 105. But when we get down to 65, we're still flowing about – 200 gallons a minute. So it makes the most of what available pressure we do have. Can't say enough good things about Key. It's an easy endorsement for me because it's the hose that my department buys, and I'm proud to know that my department does not go cheap when it comes with hose or really any other piece of equipment. Uh, very proud of that, that fact. Um, any closing thoughts there, Clark? Uh, no, sir, Cap. I did learn a lot. <clears throat> I think you are fortunate in your organization to have someone like Dave. He seems like he's very, very dialed on on the job and the requirements and things like that. So my hat's off to him. And I, it was nice having Ed on the Ed on the show as well today. It was uh, fantastic. Some new faces on here that I, I actually learned some stuff. And of course, uh, Paulie Shapiro. He's always a joy to see. And then there's Sam, and Sam's always on there, and uh, Daryl as well. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, for having me on, guys, I appreciate it, and uh, look forward to seeing you next uh, next month. Daryl, any closing thoughts? Well, those videos were were excellent. I'm wondering, does Miami Dade have a dedicated person to help produce and you know film and edit videos? Robert Hernandez. Let's give a plug to Robert Hernandez. God bless him. He is not a firefighter, but uh, he might as well be one because uh, he thinks like a firefighter. And uh, we got to give a lot of credit to him. And thank you for bringing that up and asking that. Yeah. So that goes, and a big shout out to Robert Hernandez. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I think 15 minutes is almost up. I'm going to definitely check out those uh, videos right. at fireengineering.com. <laughs> All right, brother. With the audio. And uh, I'm very interested in trying out one of those uh, turbo drafts myself. All right. Uh, any closing thoughts there, Ed Collette? Yeah, actually, Cap, real quick, what nozzle are you using to get your flows on that two inch? We are using, good question, we are using an inch and an eighth tip. Okay. At 45 pounds nozzle pressure, 45, and that gives us a flow of 250. Okay, That's thanks. And yeah, if you go to two, if you go to 50, you're at 265. Yeah. We're, we're pushing 250 at 45 pounds nozzle pressure. Great, okay, great, great. thanks. And Dave, again, excellent videos. I get, you know, very good information and excellent quality. Paulie, anything, anything uh, 
for all your students out there, including yeah. me, Paul. As you can see just by our conversations, being a pump operator is, is more than semi-technical. You need to really be on your game. Um, and just waiting for the fire to happen is not going to cut it. you, you got to have training. It, get, it gets to be boring sometimes, but you got to have training in these areas. Um, I went to one high-rise fire in my career where I actually did anything, but I trained my whole career for it, and it's just the way it has to be. Just, I used to tell my guys that pump and that hose doesn't know whether it's at a drill or a fire. It That's doesn't right. know. And you think about a professional athlete, a fighter pilot, anybody in the military, it's practice, practice, practice. And, and um, uh, I know there's a lot of departments that blindfold their, their engineers. I mean, you know, you can tell, and you know, Polly, uh, the, the body language. When you're hunting, they're hunting. And then there's the guys that pull. They'll get you water because they pull every friggin' valve on the pump pan. <laughs> uh, yeah. They'll get you water all right. <laughs> Sam. No, I'm, I would just uh, reiterate the videos. I, I think that's uh, very beneficial to a department. Um, I wish we did more of it. I, I think it's very clear. Uh, it sets a, a standard um, with expectations of how the operations to go, as well as a review. All right, Sam. Thanks very much. Dave, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you for having me on. You're a rising star in this in this department, and and uh, we look forward to a lot of more. Ways. So, uh, you you do the work. I'll take the credit for you. Perfect. All right. Until until next month, uh, we'll come up with another stimulating topic. There's a, we'll never run out of interesting. To, Andrew, you want to say goodbye to everybody? Andrew says goodbye over there. He's over in the peanut gallery. Uh, brothers and sisters, till next month, stay safe, stay healthy. And God bless you and may keep you safe in our most noble and proud profession.